I think I knocked it out with that intro music, huh, guys? Man, Dude. I was headbanging like the entire time. I'm not even lying. Like when I heard that thing for the first time, it was that thing is fire. That thing is fire. I, I thought it was fire too. It was pretty lit, not gonna lie. Yeah. All right. Hello and welcome to the inaugural episode, our first episode of Just Why, the podcast where college students try to prove that they aren't idiots but only end up solidifying it. Yes, sir. There we go. I am Jacob Smith. Along with my co-host, John McCooch and Michelangelo Ben. How are you gentlemen doing today? Doing all right. Could be better, but uh, we're in this historic moment of our lives. Absolutely. Not just the pandemic, not just the changing of the guard presidentially, but of the start of the most excellent podcast to ever grace the earth. Of course. That's why I'm having having a good day because we're getting to start this thing going. It's going to be a fun time. You know, a lot of... Bad things going on, a lot of stressful things going on. But hey, maybe this can be a little bit of a a getaway from that for people. So yeah, maybe, well, maybe. isn't that the goal, right? Yes, sir. Always the goal. Always. The goal. All right. Well, here we read and discuss stories, events, tales, and legends from the past that impose to inspire, horrify, entice, and dazzle. But overall, beg the question: just why? Maybe even get a little erotic on the right day, huh? Mm, yes, Ooh, I like yeah. that. Absolutely. Yeah, watch your pants, guys. Get a little steamy in here. Yeah. So, Hydr- yep. Make sure we hydrate as well. Always drinking that water. So, of course. As the first episode of our erotic journey, you, you guys, you guys thinking that's a good title for this? Erotic. That's the, a phenomenal. Title. The erotic yeah. journey. That, that, that'll definitely give people the perfect message of uh, absolutely. Basically, high school. I guess. Pretty much. We never left yeah. high school. I'm still there. I'm still. I'm still in middle school. <laughs> Yo, bro. All right, yeah, bro. we don't we don't need to be near some middle schools. Let's not get canceled, yeah, alrighty. Right, right, right. All right. <laughs> so, for our first episode, we are examining a tale that definitely caught my attention upon first reading it. And if I could choose any word to describe it, I think I would just have to go with frustratingly bizarre. And I think you guys will come to see both aspects of it: not only the frustration, but also the bizarreness. So puberty, yes. I'm scared. <laughs> I, I, I'm. I was pretty. I was pretty weirded out reading it. I was definitely a little. I was very, very frustrated. You'll definitely see why as we dive into the nitty gritty. All right. Well, this tale first comes to us from the book I uh, just finished reading. It's called Behind the Horde, the latest novel by Dr. Lee Miller, where he gives light to the true stories that inspired some of those famous horror movies in the industry. He covers the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I believe there's Scream in there. And this story is the inspiration for the latest movie covered in that novel. I'm not sure how versed you guys are with movies, but let's see if you guys can figure out what movie we're talking about by the time this is over with. You might have seen it, you might have not, but I think we'll definitely see. I definitely have not seen it, but I'll try. <laughs> yeah, I don't watch horror movies, but I do know about them because I'm a little bitch. All right, well, all we can ask for is effort, huh? That's all you get. I got you. That's what you get. You. Well, this is also the kind of story that can get a little hazy as the details are not exactly 100% known and some of it can be a bit of a speculation, but it definitely, it will come to pass that all the stories and all the tellings from different sources come together to give a clear picture. And I think that's what we'll be analyzing today. So, okay. Okay. We'll start with talk of the geography. The nation of Wales sits on the southwestern portion of the island of Great Britain, containing both itself, England, and Scotland. Across the sea, western Wales sits the island of Ireland, and altogether, the five of those nations, along with Northern Ireland, make altogether up the British Isles. To the southwest of Great Britain and the south of Ireland lies the Celtic Sea. Directly west to Wales, lying between Great Britain and Ireland, is the Irish Sea. And separating those generally marked by the tip of southwestern Wales and southeastern Ireland lies the St. George's Channel, named after the patron saint of England, St. George. You guys know anything about Wales? I, I'm not going to hold you. I think I guessed the movie already. Really? <laughs> Did you? Yeah, but I'm, I'm going to save that for later. All right, well, we'll see. We'll see if you're correct, I guess. Yeah, the only thing I know about Wales is that they love goats, okay? Or it's cheap. 
Well, I guess you don't know anything. Oh. <laughs> I don't know anything. <laughs> All right. I, I know a friend who's well. Wait. That's about it. Okay. Well, that's something, I guess. That's something. That's something. Well, yeah. historically, Britain has used their naval superiority to bolster their economic empire across the globe. And therefore, economic and political tr- control of imports and seaports became of high importance within the historical British economy. Economic and naval interests could often become the same as improvements in ship construction and trade imports and exports bolstered not only the pockets of the British merchant class, but also the Royal Treasury. Perhaps most interestingly, is this no more true than in the construction of lighthouses? Uh, I, I yes, I, I'm, I think I'm correct with my guess. Oh, I man. still have no idea what's going on. It has, it has Daddy Robert Pattinson. Yes. This movie does have Robert Pattinson as one of the two okay, you, stars. But the, the story of the movie and the story that we're examining today, while in the same ballpark, are not exactly the same. I would say so myself. So, okay. lighthouses have been around since the ancient times. Originally, they were as, as simple as bonfires on hilltop cliffs in order to indicate the entrance to ports rather than the modern interpretation that I think we would all know as warning sailors of incoming dangers such as reefs or rocks. So basically. There's just a giant out of control fire on dry grass on top of a hill. And I don't know what anyone would expect to do if that were to get out of control in any sort of way, considering this is some before smarts. They, they, they'll just deal with it. They're built different. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. The so first official it. lighthouse constructions date back to the ancient Greeks and Romans, most famously the Lighthouse of Alexandria, which was reported to be over 300 feet high. So. If you are 300 feet in the air in 600 BC, you are just like toying with death <laughs> because there is there is no scaffolding, there is no hooks, or I can't even imagine the kind of construction. Yeah, how would they even build? Like they don't have any kind of like you know you, you attach yourself to a, a zip line or something to nowadays. Well, I mean, maybe like, maybe they got maybe- zip lines. Maybe they had something. I don't know what they had. It's like it's like the mystery of the uh, like how do they build the pyramids? You know, like how do you get that high? Absolutely, that's the thing though. Because with with Alexandria, you had the Library of Alexandria that had countless of ancient knowledge. So probably they had some ancient knowledge on construction that we just don't know. All right. Well, up until the advent of electricity as we know it commonly these days, lighthouses were kept alight with oil lamps. And before that, although little information is available, it is assumed that common combustible materials such as wood and coal were used to keep fires illuminated. I can't even like imagine being the guy that has to lug wood across this r- rough s- patch of water just to get this fire to keep going. Like I got splinters all in my hands and across my back as I'm dragging the wooden poles there. Oh my gosh. Gotta do what you gotta do. I mean, that's just. Yeah, absolutely. Well, lighthouses moving to the Middle Ages more and more became symbols of naval and royal power. A lighthouse commissioned by French King Henry III was adorned with painted murals, decorated and engraved pillars, and even contained an elegant king's apartment should someone need to stay at the lighthouse. Lighthouses due to the whole apartment. A whole apartment, like for one person? Yeah, like there's an actual, like, living space in the lighthouse that's like actually so, good so they didn't have a guest room they had a guest house pretty more or less i would say that considering what the poverty of the middle ages is i think anyone would kill for that apartment more or less yeah yeah, yeah. They were living lavish absolutely flex all these peasants Lighthouses due to their remote locations most often resulted in long periods of isolation for the keeper and keepers who maintain such lighthouses. Logic to me would dictate that it would be best to find people who were built for this kind of situation. You know, the kind of people that didn't have much going on for themselves or didn't have many like relationships on the mainland. But it is often noted that lighthouse keepers worked other jobs and often had wives and families. So like I it's it's literally came down to desperation and needing <laughs> needing any sort of payment whatsoever yeah they didn't care yeah i can Im- I imagine that poverty back then is just a thousand times worse than it is now because oh my god because it's yeah. just like you are a literal dirt human <laughs> if yeah, you live in like a dirt it, hut it, or something yeah anywhere that's not like the royal castle is just dirty <laughs> so yeah it was pre-industrial revolution or during the industrial i mean revolution? i guess this is this story would be 
probably right in the middle of it, I would say. So yeah, yeah no, absolute filth. filth. You work in filth, you come home to filth, your wife is filth, your children are filth. And don't don't roast their <laughs> I'm not that's not a like roast. That. It's They're... just an observation. That's just how people lived. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And no one considered it dirty because that was yeah, just a the norm. Yeah. Like if everyone is covered in dirt, then no one is covered in dirt. British lighthouses in particular originally were privately owned and the ability to collect dues was waged by warrants either from corrupt local authority or the royal crown itself. So often, foreign trade ships loathed trading around the southern coast of England in fear of demands for fees, taxes, and fares of the same kind. So basically, it's just how it is now. If something's privately owned, you can hike the tax as much as you want. And if people need to get into your port, they're going to pay it. Look at look at toilet paper sales during like the beginning oh of the God. pandemic. <laughs> yeah, if something is needed and there isn't much of it, you can pay as much as you want for it. It's it's absolutely bonkers how there's just there's this family that's two thousand miles away from their home and is getting turned away because you got to spend a whole fortune on fares at this one lighthouse. They'll pay it. Why not? They just hike up the price. They they'll hike it up to whatever, I guess, right? Yeah, because there's no overarching authority on any of the lighthouses. So people could basically do whatever they wanted without penalty by any sort of upper authority. Yeah. Well, it wasn't until 1836 when rights to re refurbish privately owned lighthouses was granted to Trinity House, the official authority on lighthouses in England and Wales, of which it still is today, and also of which has a historical blog with a lot of information for the story, which will be sourced from. By then... It was that privately owned lighthouses were snuffed out, but still, large dues were able to collect it from lighthouses of popularity, one of which is where our true story actually begins. 20 miles west off the coast of Pembrokeshire in Wales sits an archipelago of basalt and dolerite rocks known as the Smalls. And in the late 1700s, these rock formations were apparently really good at taking out trade ships sailing along the Welsh coast. Imagine just vibing in the ocean and just a giant ass rock just comes out of nowhere. Yeah, I mean, these these are very shallow rocks, but they're very dark looking from what I've seen. And it's kind of hard to spot, and especially I, in these times. Yeah. So it's ever the more important to get some kind of like warning. So and such warning came through private interest and private interest by merchants who were losing business to shipments along the smalls petitioned John Phillips, a local dockmaster, to obtain a lease to the construction of a new light lighthouse situated on the smalls to warn ships of the incoming wreck possibility. So Phillips acquired this lease in the early 1770s and settled on a design created by 26 year old Henry Henry Whiteside, who was instead of a regular construction worker or engineer was, quote, a distinguished maker of musical instruments. Hmm. That was legit. So, I guess so, but I don't understand why this guy was just excellent at making lighthouses, as you will come to see. But, like, I honestly imagine that, like, he's just got a bunch of musical... Yeah. Bro, I bet them shits make fire beats. There's trumpets in the walls or something like that. Giant tuba. Yeah, dude's dropping whole bangers in the lighthouse. Not as far as our intro, though. You already know. Yeah, absolutely. From the winter of 1775 until the spring of 1776, the initial design for the lighthouse was tested and rebuilt in the small Welsh haven of Solva before establishing it on its permanent location on the actual rocks. This proved to be a good decision as testing proved that the original stilts made of some corroded iron would not support the structure against the strength of the sea. And eventually they were replaced instead with oak logs instead of some sort of metal. Honestly, I thought that would be a downgrade, but I guess metalworking of this time is not as good as we thought it would be. Yeah, no, I don't this is kind of, yeah, this is kind of like the very beginning of the industrial revolution. So nothing's really advanced as of yet. Yeah. By September of 1776, the construction on the rocks was finished and the oil lamps and lights were lit. The final structure was a 40-foot-tall wooden tower with a platform holding the light and lighthouse keeper's quarters situated on top of nine oak stilts called piles that allowed the sea to wash through the structure without damage. So basically, this whole thing is like a balancing act in yeah. the sea. And 
it's just I would not be safe in any sort of way should I like have to be a situated on this i would not feel safe in the slightest no i would feel i mean just one giant wave i feel like would just take that thing out or if i mean if you had a hurricane even i mean that is just not that's not gonna end well for you absolutely or so they thought oh by december it became clear that this structure was struggling to hold against the sea's force and in january of 1777 whiteside and his blacksmith sailed back out to the smalls lighthouse to repair it While there, the Smalls were hit with a period of severe storms that stranded the two at the lighthouse for over a month. A letter from Whiteside he cast into the sea in a bottle was found on the Welsh coast. It reads the following, quote, Being now in the most dangerous and distressed condition upon the Smalls, do hereby trust Providence will bring to your hand this, which prayeth for your immediate assistance to fetch us off the Smalls before the next spring, or we fear we shall all perish. Our water nearly all gone, our fire quite gone, and our house in a most melancholy manner. Some beautiful ink. So, so this guy is struggling. Yeah. <laughs> he, he down bad. It is. That was well written, but uh, it's just, he's, he's, yeah, he's down bad. He's down bad. Yeah, he is in the most horrendous of situations right now. Yes. Well, after the aforementioned month, Whiteside and his blacksmith were rescued after being stuck on the rocks all during the winter storms. They were starving and shaken, but most importantly, they were alive. And following the period of storms which trapped them there, repairs were needed to be had to the lighthouse. Phillips, however, the dock master, and the owner of the lease, didn't have the money to do so. So instead, he turned the lighthouse over to Trinity House, the aforementioned lighthouse authority for Britain and Wales, to repair, refurbish, and collect dues at the lighthouse, and in turn for granting him at least five pounds a lease, or a year for 99 years. 99? So eventually, this, yeah, 99 years. So this guy got out with a bag. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not sure how much inflation is, but I think $5 back then is more or less a, a yearly pay. Yeah. I would yeah. say. A, a, a definitely a significant amount of money. Yeah, he said. Yeah, absolutely. But instead of completely redesigning the structure of the White House to support against further storms, the original design was maintained and was not replaced until almost 85 years after it was initially built in 1861. So basically, all those jokes we had about the structure being terrible, we look like idiots now, because it lasted 85 fucking years. Did you see... Uh, I, yeah, we do look dumb, but... Eight, how much do structures last nowadays? <laughs> pretty sure they don't last oh, how much do people last these days yeah. this it's... this structure outlived like three generations back then yeah, like 85 years everyone's dead by like 25 so that's insane yeah, people be just well the incident with whiteside and his blacksmith would be the last incident to happen at the smalls for over 24 years until another incident would fall the lighthouse with very similar situations but at a very much more Havoc cost. By this point, it was a common a common practice for a pair of lighthouse keepers, known colloquially as wikis, to take on months long shifts stationed at the lighthouse for maintenance. Most at the time were not solely of the wiki trade, but also worked other jobs during the parts of the year where they were not stationed at the lighthouse as they managed. It is also worthy to note that the Smalls Lighthouse in particular was the most remote lighthouse operated by Trinity House at the time and even today. So they are 20 miles off of the shore. That's where this lighthouse is, which doesn't sound like a lot just thinking about it, but looking at it on a map, it is far. Like it is, it is near halfway across the channel from Wales to Ireland. Especially back then where ships didn't, they didn't have motors, so yes, yeah, so this is all hand labor paddling yeah. to get out there and back. This is right before steam became a thing, really. Yeah, yes, and yeah, like I said, this is just before the industrial revolution, so a lot of this is a lot of analog stuff, and as we'll, I think you'll come to see, it is a big problem. <laughs> In 1801, the Smalls Lighthouse Wikis were two men Thomas Howell and Thomas Griffith. Thomas Howell worked as a cooper. It, which is someone who makes casks and barrels, while Griffith worked as a general laborer. Hal was the town was from the town of Kincario, 
while Griffith Griffith was from Solva. I'm sorry if I mispronounced either of those. I am not Welsh. As you'll know, Solva was the town where the original lighthouse design was being built almost 30 years ago. It is also to of note that Hal and Griffith also had not the greatest of relationships. Sources vary from the two of them quarreling often to them absolutely hating each other. So, like, as, you, as this says, these are months-long shifts in isolation, and you're stuck with someone you absolutely despise. despise. Oh, my God. I can't even, I can't even imagine how much pain. Like, I'm just, like, I'm hammering these bolts as hard as I can. Like, I hate this fucking guy. <laughs> Bro, it, it's like, we all, like, we're young. We all know it's like someone who's hates you or you hated someone in school. It's like, imagine stuck in a room with them. I can't even imagine. Or right? just like getting randomly assigned on like a group project or something with this guy. I, I'd, just be, I'd just be so mad yeah. at all, all points of the day. Maybe, maybe that's the strategy, though. Like, if someone's mad, then they're working faster yeah. to get out of there as fast as possible. They hit the nails harder or something. I imagine me screwing this nail in. It's me wringing your neck in my hands. <laughs> just like I'm screwing. What? I was gonna. What? I was gonna. I was gonna say that's that's how I look like when I'm screwing you. But I mean, okay. What? Huh? Solid, <laughs> solid joke, bro. Excellent. Good bit. Good bit. Yes, sir. Good bit. It is also worthy to note that as most wikis were at the time, both men were also married and had families Ooh. of some children. It's the details are a little hazy, but they definitely had families of some sort. Well, early in the winter of 1800-1801, Hal and Griffith sailed out to almost 20 miles off the shore of Wales to begin their shift as wikis. As already established, the winter brings some of the worst sea conditions possible, as rough seas and storms were commonplace and put anyone out at sea, let alone in isolation, in grave danger. Even in a normal situation, it would, would be difficult for the men to leave, as any request for help would come from a distress signal of some kind indicating to the shore and passing ships that help was needed. And landing at the rocky, shallow reef could also prove difficult to anyone who wasn't a very experienced sailor and knew the area to a large degree. So not shaping up well, <laughs> as no. you guys can see. There is a lot of things preventing these guys from getting any sort of contact from the outside. And I, I tried to get information on what the distress, distress signal really was, but I couldn't get what it actually was but it is analog of some kind so i imagine it's some sort of maybe a flag or a change in the light pattern or something like that I'd say it was the bad signal it was it probably was the bad signal yeah. i don't even it's cool. just they're just looking up at the sky and it's like they need batman <laughs> oh, hey they did technically in the movie i mean as you'll see they may mean more than batman oh boy well the weather proved to turn out on the worst side, as a period of rough storms similar to the ones experienced by Whiteside almost two decades earlier took hold in the Irish Sea and St. George's Channel, completely isolating the two men until their shift was over. So, it, it is pure isolation and no contact whatsoever. And as I can imagine, you probably can't even see the shore at this point due to the rough seas and the the storms it's just completely alone with this guy that you hate in this lighthouse and you're doing nothing but work <laughs> oh i feel like jumping in the ocean would be like the next plan just trying yeah. to at that point just try to swim out of there i mean you'd probably drown but is that really a worse situation I, than this i don't one? know i don't know i'm that's up for debate really for real absolutely you know, I'm kind of considering drowning myself right now. <laughs> of course. Yes, sir. Yep. Who, who doesn't? Well, inside the lighthouse itself, the two men performed their duties as required for the first week or two, surely regretting their occupational decision-making the whole time. Well, as it would come to dictate, their situation was going to get even worse. After the first two weeks, Thomas Griffith fell ill. Hal recognized that the supplies available at the lighthouse to treat him was, in short terms, ill-equipped to handle a medical emergency of this kind, or really any kind. 
I can't imagine like how good medicine is at this time, especially Terrible. considering someone who doesn't know what they're doing and hates the guy. <laughs> so he's just like, oh, look, I found this needle. This will help you out. And he's just stabbing him. <laughs> oh, and back then, the, the quality of medicine was so bad. Yeah. You're, you're good as dead. It's just like, you know what? You got bad blood. Just let some of that out. You got a cold. Looks like you're dead. Yep. Dead to anything. I, I guess that's why there are three generations in that yep. lighthouse span. Uh, so he raised the distress signal. At the time, maritime communications of this scale was, in short, archaic. So although passing ships and people could see that the lighthouse was in some sort of distress, there was no way to tell what the distress was actually about. So Damn. it could, yeah, it could range from anything to like this guy's sick and needs attention to like there's a fucking murderer in the <laughs> in the lighthouse, and they would never, and no one would know up until actually getting there and talking to the people. As passing ships saw, there was the distress signal, but the seas and the terrain made it extremely difficult to land in any sort of any sort of way in spite of this several attempts to reach the lighthouse were made but failed as the ravaging winter storms proved difficult for any vessel to to land safely at the rock without stranding themselves as a result so navy officials the two men's families and even henry whiteside himself were forced to monitor the situation from the outside hoping that a break in the weather could allow for a rescue mission to take hold so basically, Jeez. these two, this Hal is sitting there with Griffith probably throwing up all over the place and watching these ships pass by, recognize the distress signal, but can't do anything. <laughs> oh my God. Imagine that situation nowadays. Bro, I'd be so mad. <laughs> I'd be like, why are these dickheads not stopping? <laughs> Bro. And why, like, when they designed the, the, the lighthouse, why didn't they put a little dock, like, a bigger dock, so that ships could land? Well, I mean, the terrain isn't the best to build on in the first place. So, yeah, I, I but... guess it wouldn't be the easiest thing to have done. But, yeah, there definitely should be, like, something better. Something. <laughs> just anything to help them at all. They were just not prepared for the situation whatsoever. Nope. No one was prepared, honestly. Even though this happened two, get, two decades earlier, and they literally changed almost nothing. Well, it's also noted that the families of the two men would often be seen at the cliffs overlooking the lighthouse, hoping to see any sort of positive change in the situation, but without ever knowing what was actually going on inside the lighthouse. That's, that's so bad. Dude, yeah, they're literally... Everyone is stranded in some sort of way. The dudes in the lighthouse, the families that can't help them, the naval officials that can't get to them, no one can do anything. Up until They need the storms to clear in order to do literally so anything. So they're just sitting there waiting. Yes, pretty much. Everyone is just waiting to get any opportunity to try and stage a rescue mission. Oh my god. Well, as this was happening, Griffith languished in agony for weeks, bedridden with an illness that Hal didn't have any means to treat. He didn't have any equipment, any knowledge, and probably didn't even want to help because he hated him. <laughs> so this left Hal to maintain the lighthouse on his own, as letting the lighthouse fall into disarray would not only pre present danger to ships that relied on the marker to avoid rock shelves, would also probably end up getting him killed because the lighthouse would be seen as inactive by passing ships and would no longer be reported. Eventually, after a few weeks to a month, the exact date is not known, Griffith succumbed to his disease and died in the lighthouse. Now, <laughs> this left Hal in an interesting predicament. Not only has his co-worker died and left him alone in the lighthouse, but he also now has to figure out what to do with the body. You got an ocean right he there. Figured, well, here's where it gets interesting. He figured that if he were to cast Griffith's body into the sea, his past quarrels and hatred for him would implicate foul play oh. to the public and officials. Uh, an excellent account from Ivor Emlin describes the situation a little later in 1858. Quote, The body could not be thrown out to find its grave into the sea. Suspicion with her thousand tongues would point at Hal as the author of foul play. And 
that to hide a lesser fault, he had committed the greater one of murder. So this guy is stranded in a lighthouse, starving, cold, forced to do his job. And there is a dead guy in the corner that he can't do anything with because if he throws the body out, he's going to be charged with murder. How do we know he oh didn't actually God. kill the guy? That's a good question. I mean, I guess we don't. I really guess we'll come to see how the situation ends up. But yeah. I really guess there's no way to tell if he didn't like poison him in some way. Yeah. I mean, what choice do you have in a lighthouse? I don't know. Yeah, I think a little later we'll see like how some of this starts to connect. It'll make more sense. It how how would the outside world know about their past quarrels if well they're it's they're from small villages in southwestern Wales. So I guess information travels quickly because there's probably not anything else to do. Yeah. So it it it'd be it was very publicly known that they at the very least disliked each other. After a few days of Howell deciding what to do, he put his skills as a cooper to good use as he decided to fashion a coffin for his co-worker out of the boards of a bulkhead in his living quarters and placed Griffith's body within it. <laughs> so maybe he finally got a little respect. You know? He gave a man the last rights. And maybe the story's finally deciding to turn a little bit, huh? Maybe. But I doubt it. I don't know. Do you think you would want like your corpse to be respected in any way? I don't know what I would. I want think I would. If you were dead, yeah, I hope so. I don't know. I know some people just like don't care. You could just like fling them out of an airplane and they wouldn't care. Yeah. Chuck me in the woods, man. I think it it would be a good gesture, and I think I would appreciate it from the grave beyond. And maybe, just maybe, I would consider not haunting him for the rest of his life. Just maybe. Yeah. Probably give him a little tap of the shoulder every night, but yeah, that's it. Well, this good gesture and positive part of the story seemed to be isolated from once again from Emlyn's account. Then perhaps commenced the worst chapter in the surviving lightkeeper's existence of that sad time. Decomposition would quickly follow, and the body of death would vitiate the atmosphere of the two confined apartment. Oh my gosh! That so basically not means... only, <laughs> not only is he isolated, forced to work, can't the see his smell. family, and his coworkers dead, but also the whole cabin stinks of death. Yeah. Do you guys know how that smells like? I don't I want do. to imagine. I, I don't do. know how that smells. Like. Uh, that that sounds terrible. But it, I live in an apartment, right? And uh, one time in like the lower floors, this old man passed away. And no one noticed until like the smell like took over the whole hallway. Uh, oh, that's yeah. disgusting. Yeah. Oh my god. Jesus Christ. Well, terrible. Just in case you needed another downer for the story. Another one. <laughs> yeah. But just keep piling them on. Just keep. Uh, so we'll turn eventually. Maybe. All right. Well, obviously, as you could probably guess, Hal couldn't stand the rotting stench of the corpse any longer. So he moved the coffin outside onto the porch that the gallery window of the living quarters overlooked, as it was the only point he could put it outside while not casting it into the sea. At some point after, the howling gales of the winter storms, still ravaging the channel and the lighthouse, had blown open the lid of the coffin Enough that the arm and hand of Griffith became flailing in the wind at all hours of the day. Some accounts point to it tapping on the glass, indicating that the ghost of Griffith was crawling his way back to hell to get back at him. Oh my Others God. point to the waving arm, indicating to passing ships that the situation had been handled in spite of the distress signal, and they moved on without providing further information and support. So wait, 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 wait. So The ships were were, were uh, shipping by, sailing by, seeing a waving arm, thinking that's that that's an alive man. It's like, no, we're okay. <laughs> yeah, pretty <laughs> dead <much>. guy. That's <laughs> it's awesome. a dead guy it's in a awesome. coffin. It is awesome. And it's either that or the ghost of your dead coworker is trying to claw his way back into the apartment to kill you. Yeah. Either option is pretty terrible, no matter what. They're all bad. So it was at this point that Hal, with the isolation taking him over, with the lack of any help coming to saving, 
without any contact with the outside world and with the corpse of his co-worker rattling the window of his prison. Hal teetered on the edge of madness as the situation remained the same day in and day out. Temperatures dropped into the freezing range as Hal agonized just as Griffith did, waiting to see when he would be finally released from this torture. Now, Insanity and Lighthouse Keepers actually have a long, connected, and storied history reaching far beyond the imaginations of just Thomas Hal. As since their inception since the ancient era, there are a number of stories of tragic things befalling Lighthouse Keepers and their families. An article from the University of Calgary's 11th Annual History of Medicine lists several of these incidents. The first three lighthouse keepers of the Rottenest Island Lighthouse in southwestern Australia all committed suicide for different reasons. Okay. Hmm. Several incidents of insanity came from Minot's Ledge Lighthouse off the coast of Massachusetts, which is considered, quote, one of the worst assignments in the United States Lighthouse Service. One lighthouse keeper was, quote, nearly driven to insanity due to its lack of corners <laughs> so this oh. guy was going insane because the lighthouse he's stuck in is round and there's no corners <laughs> how i don't know like what's the problem like at that point dude's just like doing it for attention <laughs> like something. you gotta pick something he, he just deeper. wanted an easy way out he like, wanted a dip like come on bro something's Something bigger needs to drive yeah. you insane, not not the circular room you're in. It circles? I hate circles. That's that's the vibe. Why is not square? <laughs> God, I'm gonna kill someone. <laughs> this doesn't make sense. Another incident followed William Brown, the first lighthouse keeper for the Bellinus Island Lighthouse in British Columbia. In May of 1905, he was sent to New Westminster Asylum. His wife described him as, quote, hopelessly insane and violent after his stint as lighthouse keeper. Well, once Brown left the lighthouse, he seemed fine, and the asylum released him in less than a month. However, in June of 1905, it's noted that Brown returned to the lighthouse to work, and by April of 1906, he was once again sent back to the asylum. Oh my god. So basically... He just wanted an out. Low key sounds like it. I mean, I guess, but he's being sent to an asylum, and there's nothing. There's nothing else on him following him getting sent back. But also, like, how did no one recognize that this is the reason he's going fucking crazy? Man, it's like, man, I wonder what this lighthouse keeper's problem is. <laughs> Not back then, the um, you know how like nowadays we have uh, so much programs that help people with mental health issues. Yeah. Back then, mental health wasn't even considered a thing. Yeah, so absolutely. It's like, like, the guy probably had like maybe some anxiety. Yeah, I mean, whatever. up until 1960, like m mental asylums were just prisons. Yeah. Yeah. So, and if you are mentally ill in any sort of way, you're just kind of fucked. Another incident at Langara Point, another British Columbian lighthouse, it is reported that an assistant lighthouse keeper in the 1950s, quote, went off the deep end. Oh, no which is a bit of an understatement. The assistant decided to drink methyl hydrate, which is used as a solvent or antifreeze, and, and decided to just run off into the Canadian bush. <laughs> While his co-workers were organizing a search party to find him, he returned to the lighthouse, but he was butt naked, disheveled, screaming, and winging in, swinging an axe like a caveman. What sounds like... <laughs> My type of let me okay, let me not. This guy, this guy is on a whole new level of insanity. Yeah, off the deep end was a bit of an understatement. I don't even know how to describe just how insane he is. Other incidents report that following lighthouse stints, keepers were struck with stints of depression, dizziness, memory loss, and a tendency to commit crimes such as assault and murder. Okay. Oh my gosh, a tendency for that. That's not. So honestly, right. how in comparison, how is it getting that that bad end of a stick? Honestly, because he's just going like regular crazy. These guys are going like bad shit, mega yep. crazy. <laughs> yeah, they're going bad shit crazy. I can't even imagine just trying to do your job at the lighthouse and your coworker goes fucking bonkers 
and runs in naked, swinging an axe at you. Like now, do you, like bro, I'm just you, trying to feed my what you, family. What do you do <laughs> if you're just being? I yeah. don't even know. Like, what do you you just? What you try to calm them down? Hey, buddy. Uh, <laughs> no, please. I'm gonna kill everyone. <laughs> Hey, bro, you just pull out a sword and an axe and, like, you know... Uh, yeah. dun, 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 common, dun, dun. common things to find yeah. at a lighthouse in the 50s. Yes, sir. Okay, we got a sword right. in the back. Honestly, though, uh, this brings up a good question. Was it the job of the lighthouse, or were there something deeper behind it that well, caused insanity? Well, hold that Ooh. thought. Finally, the weather broke enough for Hal to be rescued. H- how, how long do you guys think it took for someone to come and rescue him? Like, give me a I'm ball. out. A yeah. year or two. A year or two? Man, you guys mm-hmm. are generous. It's well, it was, it was four months after the two sailed to the lighthouse. But consider this. He came out with supplies for a month or two. <laughs> oh my, my gosh. gosh. So he is literally probably a shell of his former self. Yeah. Imagine in just four months, you see a person die, decompose, you go insane. Like, I can't even, like, imagine the kind of stress put on this guy's mind. Even after being half-starved, nearly frozen, and teetering on the edge of madness, Hal kept the light in the lighthouse going for his entire four-month ordeal. Now, that that's commitment. That's the kind of worker I want working yeah. for me. Even when you go insane and start swinging axes all over the place, you still do your job. Yeah, you still get the job done. Well, both Hal and what remained of the corpse of Thomas Griffith returned to the shores of Wales. Hal's hair had reportedly turned a graying white after the ordeal, and the mental and physical toll that the situation had placed on him had obvious effects on his personality. This guy aged like 40 40 years and four months. Yeah, that's definitely where that kind of trope comes from. From Ivor Emlyn's account once again. Howell's attenuated form demonstrated the sufferings, both mental and physical, he had undergone. His friends, in some instances, failed to recognize him on his return home. Four months in such a place and under such circumstances, what would it not affect? (laughs) It's a pretty good take. Very, (laughs) very easy. Like, I can't even imagine just seeing the only person you had the opportunity to talk to throughout your entire ordeal die three weeks in and you're stuck there with his corpse for three and a third just stuck smelling him all day (laughs) yeah it vitiated the atmosphere i had to look up what that word meant (laughs) (laughs) while you're trying to like keep a sense of sanity i feel like maybe him working the lighthouse and keeping the light on was like his way of keeping him there Uh, yeah it's honestly it's the kind of thing where it's like it's the only thing that's consistent (laughs) and it's the only thing that matters at that point but also consider that those other stories those people were not like stuck there to the degree that Hal was yeah like like they're on islands and maybe a bit offshore for sure but this is the most remote white lighthouse in trinity house's arsenal and he had a dead guy sitting next to him for most of the time so like come on like pull it together guys this like honestly i give hal credit for not like actually jumping into the sea at that point i didn't honestly i i feel like did what does did they find out what disease the um the dead guy had no they never found out it was an unknown disease interesting but we'll hold that thought once again Recent speculation and evidence provided by the University of Calgary medical article that we mentioned beforehand speculate that lighthouse keepers were exposed to chronically low doses of mercury vapors. Many lighthouses of the 19th and 20th centuries were run with mercury drive systems and mercury bath supports that could weigh up to 900 pounds. Keepers, as their jobs listed, were also regularly interacting with such materials as logbooks and journals indicate that keepers would, quote, lower the mercury bath, wipe the dust and debris off with a rag, and drain and top off the levels of the metal as needed. So basically, these guys are one step short of, like, licking these things yeah, up answer. and down on the daily. <laughs> and, and it's crazy to me how often, like, this kind of stuff happens, where it's, like, this new miracle material that 
does so many things, so many positive things ends up being poisonous. Yeah. Asbestos. Asbestos, definitely. Lead, nickel, like it's it's all that kind nickel of stuff. Radium. It's just like pretty much. It's like someone sees like, ooh, shiny thing, yeah. and then decides to make like their forks and plates out of it. But it's just cancer. And it's just killing you. <laughs> yeah. You like do their nail polish with some kind of like radium or something back then. Yeah, the, like, I, the radium girls, I think. Yeah. Yeah, they yeah. were the one. It was watches. That's what. They, it was. Okay, yeah, yeah. They put in the watch. Yeah, but like I think I read something about that a while ago. It's like they had to lick the tip of the tool they were using. Yeah. In order to like get it right, so they're literally yeah. radioactive material. Yeah, it's just yeah. <laughs> they were just eating nukes on the daily. That sounds like my type of job. <laughs> it's like, but sure. like honestly, at that point, if if you're off the deep end, I wouldn't be surprised if you started like, no, oh, this would taste. <laughs> It's good to, uh, it's all I got. <laughs> I'm gonna. And, I gotta get out of the teeth. It just looks so dangerous. I'm so enticed. And did he ever run out of food too? Because that could be. I I I I mean, I guess he did, but he didn't. He didn't run out of food enough to kill him. How did he not start eating like the body? I I don't know. I mean, at this point, he's just off the off the deep end. So. I guess it didn't, it didn't cross his mind that he's that he would I'd start, hope not. start eating the guy next to him. Maybe start like fishing or something. Just start pulling fish out of the ocean or something. I don't know. But like with the storms going on, I don't think that would work. Like <laughs> the all right, water. I got, I got my fishing pole. I got my bait. Yeah. Um, let me step outside on the gallery, and there goes the fishing pole. <laughs> I, I, I understand that they're like. Uh, uh, in open sea basically at that point but imagine the water the closer you get to mainland how nasty it was yeah i'm sure they're like oh. crashing against the cliffs on the daily oh yeah but like it's just it's just fucking crazy that like up top of all the psychological implication they're also getting poisoned the whole time <laughs> like if you needed another another reason well there you go yeah <sighs> yeah that's that's probably what makes the supernatural aspect of the story is that what they think is some entity that's messing with them is in reality poison. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, this is this is where the story of Thomas Howell and, and Thomas Griffith end, but the story of Small's Lighthouse continues. Ooh. In 1831, a similar storm tore up the floor of the lighthouse platform and injured the workers inside one enough to kill but still the lighthouse was repaired and lasted another 30 years before being replaced by a more modern design in 1861 so basically this thing's more or less cursed <laughs> like, like if you're wor- if you're working somewhere and the floor is just all of a sudden not there like just take the L just knock it down <laughs> yeah it's done yeah like it, it doesn't even matter at this point the new lighthouse was considered, quote, a marvel of modern engineering for its time and is still the one that stands off the coast of Wales to this day. So uh, Trinity House, the overarching authority, as you'll remember, also the situation made it obvious that changes had to be made. So in all Trinity operated lighthouses, the standard shifted from two wikis working at one time to three in case of a similar disaster. And I would also help hope that it would help to spur the advancement in signal communication <laughs> because there's just no way for these guys to tell them that they're having a medical emergency other yeah, than proper other than raising a like, for... yeah I, I i really like hope they stockpile these places with food and medical supplies something like honestly something because it seems like these guys just went in with nothing <laughs> nothing there and they, they no just one kind of took them off and said all right uh let's just hope nothing goes wrong you should be okay and then everything does go wrong every time yeah and it's like who could have who could have imagined <laughs> yeah oh, so we're sitting in the middle of the ocean with a remote lighthouse and storms everywhere That'll who needs fine. supplies who needs, <laughs> don't need who, who, who needs water they clean water food. <laughs> oh my god well all British operated lighthouses maintained the three man rule up until the mass automation of lighthouses in the 1980s. 
and over a dozen Canadian lighthouses were restricted from public tourist access in 1999, following tests that mercury levels were way above safety standards. <laughs> so, and I find that crazy how these places that have been poisoning people since the goddamn 1800s were quarantined off 200 years later. Just now. That's crazy. They were just signing up to get poisoned. Yeah, and I imagine, like, they switched off of Mercury as soon as someone discovered, hey, this is killing people. But, yeah. like, still, the residue and, like, the mildew created from the Mercury, it was still, like, it's in, like, the walls of the place. They had no it's idea. Like, yeah, it's like a mini Chernobyl. So, like, there's literally nothing you can do. Yeah, you're just, you're just screwed at that point. Yeah. So, like, they quarantined them off to the point where it's like you can't even no one can even be in here for more than five minutes without getting sick in some sort of way like that's how bad some of those places were well this incident served as a source of inspiration for the 2019 movie the lighthouse directed by robert eggers starring robert pattinson and willem dafoe which explores similar themes of isolation madness and the murder that he would have been accused of which Hal is experienced those four months in 1801. One interesting fact about the movie, I never saw it, by the way, but like I, I look up these movies and know about them, surprisingly. They, they, they spoke in the same language they would speak back then. Robert Pattinson and William Defoe. Like, like Welsh? Um, yeah, well, Old English. Oh, Old English, got it. They, they learned from scratch how to speak, write, I'm pretty sure read like... Old, old English. Yeah, well, I, I from reading the synopsis and research for this story, I pretty much like could match a lot of the hallucinations and insanity to what Hal was probably experiencing. There's not a lot of detail on exactly what his insanity was like, but the, it's definitely something fucking crazy, considering yeah. what everyone else is going through. Oh my god, it's it's. You can't even like put in a words. Yeah, but... it, it's it's honestly just it's, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna have to watch that movie. It's if if it's available anywhere, just to get a better understanding of this story because it's really interesting. It really is uh, mm -hmm. how trapped these people were. Yeah, you know, just on this lighthouse, and then you know the guy goes insane, then the guy one guy dies, and it's like, oh yeah, by the way, uh, little tidbit. There's mercury everywhere. It's like, what What else can go wrong? There has to be something else that can go wrong. And everything just keeps piling on top of each other. Just bad thing, bad thing, bad thing. Like, yeah. How can and, you get worse? Yeah. It honest, I honestly can't even imagine. Maybe some ghosts. Yeah. Or like a vampire just came out of the, co came out of the coffin. <laughs> something. <laughs> like, you see, like a mermaid. I mean, but then they're like, oh, it's the hallucinations. And then, you know, you see an like, actual vampire just tackling it. Like I can only I can only imagine that like the story's just going like Hal's just sitting there like oh come on <laughs> another thing oh great more to the party yeah oh my goodness. get me out of here yeah but he never did well that's where the story ends as far as uh, I know as far as we know who knows what else happened I mean I still have my theory that um. You know, the guy was killed. The guy who died was killed by the guy. And then he was just like, oh, yeah, I'm insane. That would have been something. Like, it was just a <laughs> yeah, long he's plot. Just copping out with the insanity yeah. plea. It's kinda... just like, if I start swinging axes at people, they'll just say I'm insane. Yeah, it's kind of smart, honestly. If, it, if, that's it, if that is what happened, you know, he could. Uh, the more likely scenario is that th this is, you know, the story, the accounts is what happened. But it's always fun to speculate. Yeah, absolutely. Well, but, there's, not, there's yeah. not much known about how following the incident. But immediately after, it's noted that his hair had turned white and he was emotionally and physically unrecognizable. Yeah, that's 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 a uh, that'll easily disprove the murder theory, because there's no way you would go under enough stress to make you age like 30 years. Yeah, um, I if it imagine, wasn't, you know, all those other things and going insane and whatnot. Maybe if you were guilty, that that could also be it. But I feel like I mean, maybe obviously the description could be a little exaggerated, but I doubt it. Um, yeah, yeah. The guilt for sitting in a lighthouse and then just staring every day at the guy that you probably just killed—that could also be a thing. It could go either way. Either way, it's either way. 
the mercury is still there. <laughs> so yeah. about that too. It's, I and mean, it, it's not even in the bath anymore. It's in the walls as these yeah. as these surveys have shown. Like there's literally even if you're not directly interacting with it on a daily basis as these guys were, they it is literally in the walls of the building. So there's yeah. no way to avoid it. You can't. Yep. Do you guys know how to get mercury? I know mercury's in fish, but do you know how they would be able to extract like those large quantities of mercury? I have no I have no idea. I don't know enough about lighthouse management. Or but there was a shit ton of mercury there. <laughs> I can yeah. say that much. 900 pounds. That's what it was up to. 900 pounds. That's all. God damn. Yeah. Okay. And these guys are regularly like rubbing it. Yeah. Actively. This so. is before they knew that this is deadly. Because, I mean, if you see a drop of mercury nowadays, you're supposed to, like, evacuate the building. And, like, you yeah. can't go in that building for X amount of time until they go in with, like, hazmat suits and clean out. These guys were rubbing 900 pounds of that stuff. Yeah, like, up and down their body. <laughs> yeah, it's insane. <laughs> Bathing in it. Now, my, like, my school gets evacuated when a light bulb pops or, like, yeah. a thermometer breaks. <laughs> yeah. But like these guys are literally licking it up and down. Yeah, it's like part of the, maybe he was eating the mercury. That was how he survived. He survived by eating the mercury. He built an immunity to it. Yeah, yeah. He that, became the mercury. He just became a mercury. Person. One with the mercury. Yeah. Well, that's the end of the first episode of Just Why. I hope this story definitely frustrated you and and you found bizarre. Oh, it did. And one qu- and for the audience out there, do you suspect foul play? I mean, That's it's a, so hard to question. say, but like him being in that state when he left the lighthouse, I think would indicate he's not guilty. Yeah, I mean, I love Maybe, to other thoughts but, on it too. There could be some kind of thing we're missing here in this story. Yeah, I mean, the story was the so murder. long ago. But it's been told se- in several different ways and through several different sources, but no source has ever given me any inkling of what exactly started happening when Hal was going crazy. Yeah, it's kind of impossible to really get a true beat on it because it's just the nature of it. But Absolutely. Well, that's the end. Uh, if you guys are interested in sports in any way, you can hey. go over and check out my man Cooch's podcast, on the break, follow him on some social medias. I imagine. What are, you, what are your tags, Gooch? Uh, we got, uh, you know, we got at on the break cast on Twitter. That's my favorite one right there. I love the Twitter. We, we're big Twitter fans out here. On the break podcast, uh, on the break cast, on the break pod, somewhere in there. And yeah, mm-hmm. we're still still pumping out. We got the NFL playoffs going on, so it's going to be a very interesting time. And uh, for the, I mean, we're both, we're all three of us are basketball fans. We just saw James Harden get traded. I mean, there's a lot of going to on, the so, Nets, uh, the Nets, yep. yeah. But this is just why. So very, very uh, interesting time indeed. Yeah. Uh honestly. That trade collab in the future. Why. Yeah, maybe. We'll see. Yeah, maybe, maybe some sports history in the future. Yeah. Well, sure. well, I'm sure we'll link our socials somewhere in the description of whatever platform you decide to listen to this on. Uh Cooch, what are what are the socials for this? Just why pod, Ooh, correct? Social. At just why pod. Uh I believe on both Instagram and Twitter, at just why pod on Twitter. And yeah, you will be able to find that. Uh Excellent. Instagram and Twitter. And we'll have a tweet when the new episodes go live and anything interesting goes on that we have to put our thoughts on. They'll be on the Twitter and the Instagram, whatever we got. Excellent. And uh, I guess that's pretty much it. You guys have anything else to say before we leave? This was a great experience. Hopefully we could build on this. Like, sorry, guys, if we're like a little, you know, fruity. Yeah. Fruity. Yeah. I mean, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't judge me like that. But... (laughs) It's like this is our first podcast, so we're just trying to get used to it. Nah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we we'll good. Be, that felt pretty good. Th- yeah, if, we'll definitely be working out the kinks as we get through it. Yeah. Well, sure. thanks for listening. Have a good one.